Hey guys, survival here. I figured while we've still got some light, I'd like to start a review of a GLI net, GL AR750S EXT, also known as the Slate. Probably wondering, what is this device? Well, it's a travel router. Yes, it is literally a network router, one that's compact, small form factor, and made for travel. So let's start the review. So as you can see, the Slate Travel Router comes in a very nice, simple, yet very easy on the eye, stylish packaging. It clearly shows what it is, however, it's not in your face. So, we'll start by carefully taking the outer sleeve off, then hold the bottom of the box firmly because the lid is on very tightly. So when we take the lid off, the first thing we see is, let's get started. On the back of this first card is the quick start guide. everything you need to know to set up the device. Below that is the support card and on the back of that the warranty. Now we're presented with the top section and a lower section. So we'll start with the top section. This top section houses the other items that come with the router. So, since we're in Australia, here is an Australian pinout USB wall wart. And then in this other pouch is, is a standard USB to micro USB cable. This is for powering the device. And last but not least, the remaining accessory is a flat form factor gigabit ethernet cable. And now for the main item. Here at the front is the actual travel router. So as you can see, we've got three gigabit ethernet ports on the front, a standard USB 2 port, and a micro B port. So this micro B port is for the standard USB port is for various forms of tethering, including 3G and 4G USB stick form factor modems. These first two ethernet ports are LAN ports, and this one over here is a WAN port. If you're an experienced user and you go into advanced settings, once the device is set up, you can actually set all of these ports to work as LAN ports. There's two fixed non-detachable an antenna, one for 2.4 gigahertz and one for five. Turning the device to its side, you can see here, let's bring that in a little closer, a micro SD card slot. Now I've got a micro SD card in already, as I've already set up and been using this device for quite a while. So, the reason that there's a micro SD card slot is because this router supports file sharing. So you can share files from either the micro SD card or from a USB stick or an external hard drive connected via the standard USB port. It is advised that if you go to connect an external hard drive, you make sure it has its own power supply, as external hard drives can be very demanding when it comes to power. And you've got to keep in mind, this router is solely powered 5 volt 2 amp 
the USB 2.0, so it doesn't have much power to share. If we turn the device around to the other side, you can see we've got the reset button. If you look right at the middle of this side, we have a mode switch. We'll explain more about what that switch does when I show you how to set this up. And on the front of the device, we have a power LED, a 2.4 gigahertz LED, and a 5 gigahertz LED. These are just status lights. These LEDs are noticeable, but definitely not what I'd call in your face. So let's get to it. I've connected the power cable for the slate to my USB port on the computer here. I've connected the ethernet cable from the laptop to the middle ethernet port on the little travel router. And I've waited for the three lights on the front of a device. And this is the first page I met with when I navigate to the default IP of the device. So it wants me to pick a language. It's already on the language I want. So I'll just click next. Okay, it wants me to put an admin password in. So I'll type an admin password. And submit. And here we are at the main page of the custom admin panel for this little pocket travel router. So as you can see here, we've got a large section here called cable for the WAN. There's a button here, which if I were to click it, would reconfigure the WAN port to be a LAN port. However, I don't want all the Ethernet ports to be LAN. I want one of them to be WAN because when I travel, a lot of the places I stay at have uh, an Ethernet cable at the desk in the corner of a hotel room through which I can access the internet. I like to have a hardwired connection to the internet where possible. Down here you can see a little section called repeater. So what that'll do is it will, if you click where it says scan, it will scan and it will let me select a network that it can detect. And then I can put the passphrase in if it needs one. And I can then use a toggle to either save or, or not save that network and have it actually repeat it. So if I tap repeater options, in case it's auto scan and reconnect. So if it finds one that it knows, it can auto do it. And the scan button will take me to a screen where, where I can have it scan and it will display the networks for me to connect to. 3G, 4G modem, this option here, is if you've got one of those little USB modems that you put a SIM card in and it then, use, and it then uses either 3G or 4G to connect uh, to a computer to provide internet via USB, you can actually plug that into the USB port on this device and config it there in order to get access to the internet. And lastly, tethering. You can choose to tether your phone uh, or other USB modem that supports a tethering mode to this router in order to get access to the internet. So if I go to the wireless page here, okay, so we can see we've got 2.4 and the 5 gigahertz Wi-Fi. It's very refreshing to see that there's actually guest Wi-Fi for each of these. So if I'm staying somewhere and I get a friend to stop by my hotel room you know, during the day and we just want to have a bit of a chat and a catch up. My friend can easily access a guest network on my little travel router without being able to see my other devices that are connected to the main networks on my travel router. That's really handy. Under clients, we can see the clients and we can even block specific clients. That's a really handy feature to have that's easy to access. Firewall, cool, so we can do port forwarding. We can open ports and we can even set a DMZ. So we can set one IP address to be a demilitarized zone where port forwards, uh, rules regarding opening of ports don't apply. Everything is simply available. It exposes that one device directly to the internet with no protection. That can be a very handy feature to have depending on the situation and depending on whether or not the device itself has its own firewall and or other security features. One of the greatest things about this little 
travel router is its inbuilt support for VPNs. So it supports both client and server for OpenVPN. So use the client if you want to connect to a VPN provider. Use OpenVPN server if you want to be able to create a VPN tunnel from this device to another device of yours where this device is the main VPN server. And you can do the same for WireGuard. They've included WireGuard support, which is really good because WireGuard gives you the high level of security, but it works faster than OpenVPN. And once again, it's got a client and a WireGuard server. One of the great features on here is the internet kill switch. So if for whatever reason you need the VPN on at all times and you can't afford to have it disconnect as it could expose data that's getting sent, simply enable the internet kill switch. The moment the VPN is not connected, no internet or WAN traffic will be allowed to go to the LAN ports or to the wireless networks. It will simply disconnect any internet access from you within this travel router, thus keeping you safe. And it's refreshing to see VPN policies. You can turn them on or off, but basically the policy can be based on MAC address or on domain slash IP address. And then you can choose the rule that you want to apply, and that is for the policy as a whole. And that is only allow the following to use VPN or do not use VPN for the following. So you can either only use VPN for certain devices or exclude certain devices. This can be very handy depending on your setup. And they've got inbuilt support for Tor, where you can enable Tor and you can select your exit node country as either random or select it from the available list. Under the applications menu here, plugins. Because this router was built for OpenWRT, all the plugins are available. Some of these plugins may require custom config, which may require you to SSH into the device in order to config them. But I find it absolutely wonderful that we've got such a low level, far reaching access. It's not something you see often on, on a device. Usually devices are locked down, only what the manufacturer wants to let you have and only the bare minimum. Here, we've got access to everything. That said, it doesn't surprise me because GLINet, they have a GitHub repository with all the source code for the firmware that runs on this device. So you can actually go and roll your own version of the firmware, which is wonderful because it lets you see what's happening. It lets you verify that there's no nefarious code in there that could steal your data and offload it somewhere else. And if for whatever reason, you still don't trust the manufacturer provided firmware updates, simply download the latest source code, compile it, put it on the device yourself. There's no need to be 100% reliant on a closed build. There's a remote access page where you can set up cloud access or uh, DIN DNS access. There's a captive portal feature. So if you enable the guest networks, on this router, you can set up a captive portal. So you'll be able to limit how long your friends are on your guest network. This won't apply in every case, but it's handy to have. File sharing, so share via LAN. That's really good because it just means anything that's on the local area network here connected to this device will be able to access the files. Share via LAN, it'll push it to upper, and make it visible to upper level networks. So if I've connected the WAN port on this device into an existing network in order to get internet access, if I'm using share via WAN, everything at that other level of the network would be able to see the file share. So I'm gonna leave that off. Uh, writable, so if you've got an ext4 or NTFS file system, you'll be able to write to it. That's really wonderful that it actually has NTFS support. Not a lot of other devices support NTFS, Usually it's just ext4. I really love having that extra flexibility of NTFS support. And in current directory. So if I click this, so I can see now 
multiple different things here. So system volume thing there, which appeared when I formatted the card. So I can select SDA one because and click apply because I have a micro SD card that I've put in this little router. Let's just look at this last section, more settings. Okay, so admin password. Okay, so that's where I can change for admin password. LAN IP, okay, cool. So for both LAN and for guest IP, I can set the IP address ranges. I can also tell it for range of IP addresses, it can automatically assign. Anything outside that specified range within the standard can only be statically assigned. And we've got static IP address bindings here that we can set. So we can give a device, for example, this laptop, the same IP every time it connects. And we can do that for the guest IPs as well, which is really handy. Uh, we can set the time zone. And so we can click the sync button to sync with the browser, or we can use the drop down here to select Mac clone function. So this is really handy. So for example, if you connect to internet somewhere, be it a free public Wi-Fi, be it a hotel Wi-Fi or something else, and it's got a basic captive portal. So you could do that on your smartphone. You could then make sure your phone connects to this router over Wi-Fi select the MAC address of your phone, and then this router will appear to the WAN port as being this MAC address. Thus, it will think your phone is the one accessing and it's already verified against the captive portal. And now every device connected to this travel router will have internet access. That's a very handy feature to have. And I like how it actually shows the factory default so you can go back to that at any stage custom DNS server. So these are some settings we can have for the inbuilt DNS server on this device. These are settings that we can enable for the DNS. So DNS for a binding attack protection, that's on by default. Uh, we can choose to override DNS settings for all clients in case clients have different settings. Uh, we can do DNS over TLS, Cloudflare or Next DNS. Uh, DNS crypt proxy settings and manual DNS server settings are all different toggle options we can enable. I'm just going to leave that as it is for now. Okay, button settings. So this get this brings us to the button on the side of a device. Now, when they say button, they mean switch. As you can see here on the screen, they call it a switch button. We'll just call it a switch. So it's a two position switch, left and right. This switch is really handy because it lets us have a physical means of determining whether or not we're connected to VPN. So by default, no function is assigned to it. However, we can set it to do either WireGuard on and off, OpenVPN on or off, or Tor on and off. Now you can't change which side is on, which is off. That's fixed. However, being able to simply power the device up, flick a switch, give it a moment, and know that the moment then that you get internet access, the VPN is connected, is really handy. So network mode, this is something I really like about this device over many of the other travel routers. And that is I can change its mode. So currently it's a router. I can set it to be an access point. And basically, so what an access point is, is where you physically connect into a network, plugging into the WAN port on this device, but then it simply just gives off a wireless network so you get wireless access to that network that's all an access point is the one thing to note also is if you click through each mode you'll see changes so access point physically connected in via ethernet there's internet on the other side of the gateway that you're connected to firewall only exists at the gateway or between the gateway and the internet if the network has one and then there's you if we go to extender mode this is one of the things I love about this device is that I can simply use the repeater functionality that you saw on the on the main page of this admin panel in order to pick up a Wi-Fi signal, for example, hotel Wi-Fi that I've got access to, but it's a weak signal because let's say the access point that the hotel has is down the far end of a corridor. It's a concrete building and I'm all the way at the other end of the corridor. So I can get a signal at the door to my hotel room, but if I'm laying on the bed, I'm too far away, there's too many walls, I can't get a signal. So I can set the travel router up at the door to my hotel room, just inside the room, where it can actually connect to that signal. It can then extend that network 
giving me a strong signal from the travel router to my devices and effectively relay my traffic from my device to the access point to give me access, albeit at degraded speeds because of a week of a signal between the access point and this travel router when operating as an extender will be the limiting factor as to how fast I can access the internet compared to being directly connected to the access point. And there's WDS as well. This is really handy. One thing to keep in mind though, according to what it says here, when you use access point extender or WDS mode, you may not connect to this UI again. You can press and hold the reset button for four seconds to revert back to router mode. Now that is an important thing to keep in mind. Write it down on a piece of paper if you have one of these devices. Take a screenshot and print it out, fold it up, put it in the mesh pouch in the case for this device if you get the case. That is something to remember because otherwise you'll just be very frustrated. How do I get back to the interface if you've had to put it into access point extender or WDS mode? We also have a revert firmware button to take you back to factory defaults and advanced brings up an advanced set of options. Here you simply type in the password that is your admin password and it will bring up effectively a not as lively looking but a very technical back-end interface that is the kind of thing that you would expect to see if you're used to seeing things such as OpenWRT, PFSense, and it's in this section, which is where you can control things like the LED lights that are on the front of it, where you can go into enabling, disabling interfaces, where you can do a lot more fine tune control of the device as a whole. I'm not gonna go into that for now because this is not a tech channel. Uh, if I go to upgrade, so we can see here, it's running version 3.105 because I did a firmware update on it when I first got it and I simply did that by means of doing a local upgrade and either dragging a file on there or clicking on where it says select a file and drag it here and clicking it and then selecting the appropriate file and following the prompts. And there is an auto upgrade function if you want to let it auto update. And so that's all that it takes to set up the device. It's a very nice modern admin interface. It's very user-friendly and informative interface that tells you what you need to know as you need to know it. One thing before I go just to let you know is where it's got this shield here that says VPN and it's got a little X on it, that will change into a tick when you have a VPN connected. That's one of the things I really like about this is this little visual at the top of the admin panel is a live updating status of this little travel router. There is however one accessory that I highly recommend you get and that is get the applicable storage pouch for the GLINet device you buy. This is the pouch for the slate. It's got one large zipper that goes around the outside, a very strong well attached pull tab allowing you to quickly and conveniently retrieve it from your bag. When you open the pouch, one side has a common central elastic that is segmented. So this is where the slate goes. And here and here, you can put its cables. On the other side of the pouch is a nice large mesh pouch where you can put any other accessory that you need to take with you or want to take with you be it other usb sticks another ethernet cable or as a friend of mine suggested a small little device such as a chromecast so let's see how it fits to start gently put the antennas down making sure that these nice rounded corners are near the outside and that when being careful to not hook the antennas on the elastic, slide the device in. Next largest or bulkiest 
item. The USB cable. And lastly, the Ethernet cable. As you can see, the pouch is slim and everything is happily contained where it is. I give it a little shake. And now carefully go to open it up. Everything is right where we left it. So you're probably wondering, what do I do with the wall ward? Well, it's very simple. Take the wall ward, put it in your carry-on bag. The wall ward is not required to use this device. The wonderful thing about the slate is that it requires only five volts at two amps to operate. As such, any good USB 2 port will be able to power this device. So you can simply plug it into a spare USB port on your computer and power the device. How convenient is that? One point I wanna make regarding removing the travel router from its pouch is to just take a little bit of care to ensure that when you pull it out you pivot it so with a rounded corner at the front I'm pivoting the rear slightly sharper corner to the back just to ensure that whichever one of these antenna is going to encounter the elastic strap doesn't snag on the elastic because the last thing we want is for our antenna to get damaged. So you're probably wondering why do I need a travel router? Well, we all carry a lot of technology with us. You mightn't realise it, but it's true. We all carry a lot. We all have at least our smartphone. A lot of us will take some sort of tablet. Usually we'll take a laptop with us if we're going overseas for business, for work, or just for a prolonged period of time in order to keep up with things that are happening, you know, stay on top of emails. And, you know, if you're, for example, if you're a photographer, well, you might want some access to some software to go over some photos, to look at some of the raw photos you've taken. It's just a convenient thing to do, just to take a laptop. The problem with these devices is, with the exception of a laptop, all the rest are designed around the concept of having either internet access or at least network access to a local network. Now, when I say local network, I don't mean cellular network, like a mobile phone company. I mean at least, you know, a home network, be it wired or wireless. The Slate provides that. One of the biggest driving factors as to why I chose to get a travel router was all the times that I was in a hotel room, there was no free Wi-Fi, you know, not even paid Wi-Fi because Wi-Fi just wasn't a thing. If you wanted internet access at a hotel, you had to plug in this Ethernet cable that was on the desk in the corner of the room. That meant only a device with an Ethernet port could get internet access. And it also meant that if I wanted to move data from one device, such as my phone or my tablet, I had problems. I needed to have a that formatted USB in order to move files. That brought with it limitations of no file could be larger than four gigabytes. And it meant that a lot of other functionality, which would let me move data a lot faster, was not available. It also meant that only one device had internet access, which was really frustrating. Because who wants to have a laptop with them on the bed just to watch something when they could simply have either a tablet or their phone, a much smaller, lighter device? Well, travel routers like this, they address that. One of the reasons that I chose the Slate is at the time of recording this video, this, as far as I could tell, it is the most fully featured travel router that can route over Ethernet at full gigabit speed. Now regarding what I was saying about accessing the internet through one cable device, how does this help? Well, 
connected device via Ethernet, authenticate through the captive portal, then adjust in the settings on this router, the MAC address. This router has a feature which lets you make it appear by using MAC address cloning as any other device of yours. Thus, as long as you've authenticated the captive portal on your laptop, simply set this travel router to appear as that laptop and connect the laptop wirelessly to this travel router and every device that connects to this travel router will be able to access the internet as most captive portals only look at the MAC address of devices that have been approved or let through the captive portal. The other reason that this is a wonderful device is let's say there is some free hotel Wi-Fi but the signal strength is good at the door but it's bad down the other end of the room where the beds are. You can set this device up near the door, connect it in using a wall wart, and you can actually use this as a Wi-Fi range extender. You can connect it to the network, providing the wireless network only requires a passphrase, and then have this repeat out a stronger signal, thus giving you better connectivity from the other end of your hotel room, so you can actually access the internet whilst on your bed. Two other bits of functionality to point out. This USB port, it serves two purposes. The first, similar to the microSD card, it allows you to connect either a USB stick or an external hard drive, and it will actually operate as a file server or mini NAS, allowing you to access those files from any device that connects to this travel router. This is a really great bit of functionality as it lets you move data and offload data very quickly between devices. That same USB port on this travel router can also be used, should the location you're at not have any free internet access, you can use your own internet access, be it your phone, a USB modem, in order to get internet access and have it available to any of your devices that connect to this travel router. And even if you don't have internet access, why would you still want a travel router? As I mentioned earlier, there are plenty of times where you want to be able to have access and the ability to move data between multiple devices of yours. That requires a router. This allows you to do that, even without internet. And remember, stay safe in the bush.